Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Welcome back to Visualizing Abolition today with Dred Scott and Aaron Gray. I'm Rachel Nelson, Director of the Institute of the Arts and Sciences at UC Santa Cruz. Today's discussion is part of a longer series coordinated with Gina Dent on art, prisons, and abolition. Past events can be found at barringfreedom.org. There are people I should thank right now, including UC Santa Cruz Legal Studies for their partnership on the series. I should also remind everyone that Barring Freedom at San Jose Museum of Art, the exhibition curated with Alexandra Moore, featuring the work of Dred Scott and other amazing artists is closing on Sunday. But after the emotional events over the last weeks, culminating in today's verdict, I wanna keep the focus on the matter at hand. Both the exhibition and the visualizing abolition events highlight how contemporary artists, musicians, activists, and scholars are creatively taking part in the struggles against the historic inequality and racism rife in prisons and policing, struggles which led to today. The conviction comes with a big exhale, not only for George Floyd's family, but for the many organizers and people who've taken to the street to make this possible. The decision of the jury to convict is evidence that the nation has been made to look at its own workings to some extent and to denounce what Angela Davis and others have called the public lynching of George Floyd. As someone sh shouted outside the courthouse in response to the verdict, don't ever let them tell you protests don't work. Yet as the many amazing creatives who've joined us over the last months have made clear, this conviction is not the end goal. As we waited to hear the jury decision in Minnesota, I was reminded of the myriad ways that the people we have collaborated with on this initiative have asked us to remember that the societal issues manifest in our criminal justice system and our society far surpass the actions of any one person or any one homicidal police officer. There remains deep urgency to think beyond individual culpability and beyond prisons as the solution for exactly the problems they promote. This is why I'm so glad to have our two guests here today, both of whom are revolutionary in thinking and practice adept at imagining radical societal transformation. I'll welcome them now and have them join me in this virtual space and keep my intros brief to give them the floor. Hi, y'all. Hi. So, so Dr. Erin Gray is a writer, educator, and activist, as well as assistant professor at UC Davis. Across her writings and research on art, visual culture, and poetics, Erin questions the aesthetic production of racist and anti-racist thought. Her current book project, The Moving Image of Lynching, Liberalizing Racial Terror in the Long Photographic Century, looks at how US histories of lynching, as well as the circulation of lynching photographs, are imbricated into current systems of racial capitalism and liberalism. Stay tuned for that incredible work. Dred Scott is an artist who thinks of revolution as art praxis. Staging reenactments of historical events, including in 2019, the reenactment of the largest rebellion of enslaved people in US history in Louisiana, as well as other historical acts of resistance, like his repurposing of the flag hung by the, double a by the NAACP between, I think, 1920 and 1938, though Aaron can correct me, whenever a lynching occurred in the US to respond to the, whenever a lynching occurred in the US. Dredd reuses this flag to respond to the contemporary murders of Black people by police today. His work is exhibited widely, and it was a pleasure to have the opportunity to include his work in Bar and Freedom. And we're so happy to have Dredd and Aaron in conversation today. So thank you both for being here. And I'm going to turn this over to you, Aaron, and then Gina and I will be back for questions and answers later. And we'll introduce the Music for Abolition video premiere by Diane Reeves and Camilla Cortini Bello then. Thanks, y'all. Thanks for having us. Yeah. Thank you so much, Rachel. And uh, hi, Dred. It's good to see you again. Hi. Yeah. Good afternoon, mm -hmm. everyone. Um, good evening to folks on the East Coast. Um, I want to begin my opening comments today by acknowledging where I'm located. I'm in occupied Huichin, the traditional territory of the Lishan Ohlone people, uh, which is more commonly known by its settler name of Oakland, California. Ohlone people the first people of the lands in and around the Bay Area continue to struggle to protect the West Berkeley Shell Mound, a nearly 6,000 year old sacred burial site uh, from becoming the site of a multi-use development. And I wanna thank Ohlone organizers, in particular, Karina Gould, the spokesperson for the Confederated Villages of Lishan Ohlone 
and co-founder of Indian People Organizing for Change for providing leadership uh, and vision in local efforts to build sustainable relations and worlds. And if folks are watching in the East Bay and wanna learn more about local decolonization efforts, they can check out the Segorite Land Trust, an urban indigenous women-led rematriation project that facilitates the return of indigenous land to indigenous peoples. And I'll throw a link uh, in the chat later on and I also just wanted to remind people of um, Abolition May, which is coming up. And it's, it's a month long um, series of actions that has been called for by Cops Off Campus, which is a coalition between University of California and um, California, um, the, C the CSU system. And I'll also drop a link um, in the chat about that. So on May 3rd, um, you know, we're being called to withdraw our labor um, on Monday, May 3rd. So do check that out. I wanna thank my dear friend, Rachel Nelson for curating Barring Freedom and for lighting the spark uh, that has become this incredible series, Visualizing Abolition. Um, it's really been amazing to take in the discussions over the last several months that Rachel and Gina have convened, right as abolition has entered mainstream discourse. Um, you know, it's, it's troubling, perhaps troubling, it, you know, its entrance into mainstream discourse, but it's there nevertheless. And I really appreciate that we've been able to participate in these discussions in a slower way than Rachel and Gina had initially planned. And I think it's one of the opportunities that the pandemic has afforded at least some of us. So switching from, um, you know, what I think was initially thought of as a kind of two day symposium, rapid fire you know, event as, you, as these things usually are to this kind of online format allows us to slow down uh, between conversations and have time to process and you know, metabolize what we're learning together. And I think that this um, ability to slow down is really important and I think it's a, an important part of, of living and enacting abolition, um, thinking about what you know, Avery Gordon has called abolitionist time. And I expect that time and history will be at the center of today's discussion with artist Dred Scott, whose work is part of Barring Freedom. I'm honored to be joining Dred in conversation today as part of this project of visualizing abolition. I first met Dred in the spring of 2019 when he organized a reenactment of Henry Highland Garnett's incendiary abolitionist speech an address to the slaves of the United States of America. Organized as part of a series on radical left free speech, the reenactment was entitled A Time for Seditious Speech, and it was activated by a group of Black performers at the historic grounds of Weeksville, the site of the first free Black settlement in New York City. New York-based radical abolitionist Henry Highland Garnett originally authored the speech in 1843 for delivery at the National Convention of Colored Citizens in Buffalo. In it, he implores his audience to take up arms against the institution of slavery. To his enslaved readers, he recommends the complete withdrawal of labor. Quote, brethren, the time has come when you must act for yourselves. It is an old and true saying that if hereditary bondmen would be free, they must themselves strike the blow. You can plead your own cause and do the work of emancipation better than any others." End quote. When the leaders of the Buffalo Convention rejected Garnett's address for encouraging insurrection, his radical abolitionist friend, David Walker, who was based in Boston, published Garnett's speech in his own incendiary call for rebellion uh, in his pamphlet, Walker's Appeal. During Dredd's reenactment of the speech in 2019, participants moved slowly through the sun-drenched Weeksville gardens and roadhouses as the performers, black men, women, and non-binary people, raised Garnett's seditious speech into the air alongside spirituals and other freedom songs that spoke to the collective cunning of black survival. Dredd's team invited us into Garnett's call to rebellion with an abundance of care delivered among the remains of the first black settlement in New York in an, in an environment of maroon 
or fugitive sociality. And in the voices of young Black Americans enduring an intensification of proto-fascist visuality and racial terror via neoliberal surveillance mechanisms, Garnett's remediated call to rebellion in 2019 felt lovingly bellicose as though it had been infused with the energy of abolition feminism with its uh, collective delivery. Um, really, I think parting ways with, you know, a kind of cultural focus on, on figureheads and leaders, um, an important part of abolition feminism uh, was to critique the masculinist tendencies of the abolition movement. And, and in particular, the idea of leadership altogether. Um, so I see that being animated in, in the, the reenactment of the speech. And I also saw in it um, a kind of focus on a, the protective quality through which um, participants were called into the space of the speech itself. So with Weeksville as its backdrop, um, the renewed speech underscored Garnett's call uh, to me for the violence of the strike. In addition to working as a provocation to rebel against the authority of the police state, the 2019 version underscored the necessity of what Ashila Mbembe refers to as a quote, voluntary cessation, a conscious and fully consent, consensual interruption, right? So the, the withdrawal of consent, the withdrawal of, of our labor to reproduce settler colonial and racial capitalist accumulation and logics. So what emerged for me in this performance was a reclamation of black militancy, black autonomy, and the capacity, importantly, the capacity to make black home and life out of and among the ruins of dispossession and accumulation. So within this uh, Weeksville reenactment um, of Henry Highland Garnett's abolitionist speech, uh, for me was an incitement to remember the kinds of prefigurative revolutionary community building projects that don't lend themselves as easily to historical documentation, right, as do speeches and convention records. Um, and it also underscored for me the importance of kind of seizing what Bridget Cooks recently called black time. So I'm fascinated in the ways that dread reactivates historical texts. And my interest in reactivating historical texts is rooted in my work as a writer and critical theorist, educated among, by, and with many of the abolitionists centrally involved in visualizing abolition. So I'm working on a book called The Moving Image of Lynching that looks at the long durée of US lynching culture from slavery times to today. In it, I interrogate the commonsensical progressive narrative that has defined historical scholarship on lynching in this country. Historians routinely tell us that lynching ended in the immediate post-World War II period and that all the forms of state sanctioned violence that characterize the era, the era of Cold War civil rights and neoliberal backlash that has sought to retrench the modest gains of that movement are extricable from this country's founding genocidal and paramilitary violence. I mobilized the analyses of lynching that were undertaken by abolition feminists and black radicals like Ida B. Wells, Harry Haywood and Claudia Jones who argued from the post reconstruction period up through the depression years and into the emergence of um, US military aggression in Korea in the 1940s and 1950s that lynching was one of the signal institutions of settler nationalism and racial slavery. So in order for us to see and critically engage uh, how fundamentally this violence has shaped American life and its institutions I mobilize uh, an abolitionist analysis of the settler state's reliance on extra judicial and extra economic violence, right? And the whole point of this is to fashion, really to try to uh, fashion an alternative analytic through which we might engage images of violence, as well as those forms of violence that go unimaged um, in radically new ways. And part of, part of this work is also meant to uh, disarticulate lynching from, from solely the rhetorics of anti-Blackness um, and racial slavery so that we make necessary connections between um, indigenous dispossession, anti-Asian removal, um, and all the other forms of, of white supremacist racializing terror um, that some of us have been able to see a little more plainly um, in the last few years. 
So I'll turn it over uh, to Dred now. Okay, Aaron, thanks for that. That's really great. Um, I just have to have a minor correction uh, to the uh, reenactment at Weeksville. I was a happy participant, but I was not the organizer of it. And I just want to make sure that, I mean, it was Weeksville and the Viralist Center that organized that, but everything else that you said was spot on. It was truly a moving thing to participate in and to bring that speech, which, you know, seems so incendiary at the time, but was still amazingly incendiary into the present. And, and, and I think that it's, you know, it's really, is really thank you for sharing that with this audience because it, it it's the speech hopefully people will go back and check it out um but also the way it was reactivated with with you know multiplicity of voices and moving through weeksville was really powerful and profound and so it was it was actually great to hear you bring me back to it because you know it's like i hadn't thought about it in a year and a half and it's like yes that was truly radical and amazing so um i want to just and, and I, largely what I'm going to do is very quickly show a few works of art of mine to sort of give some background of what I do, because when, you know, I say I'm an artist, people often think, oh, you paint or you draw. But before I do that, and it will be a really quick tour de force, I do just want to sort of, you know, say, you know, guilty, guilty, guilty. <laughs> it's like this, the people fought like hell and, and we got one pig. Uh, you know, convicted, and that's really good. And that's the backdrop of, I think, what a lot of people are thinking about. And I'm, you know, hopefully this, that weaves into our conversation somehow, but I'm just going to now share my screen, show a little bit of art, and then we'll have a really cool conversation. Um, uh, yeah. Okay, so, um, you know, as I said, when, when I Tell people I'm an artist, they think, oh, you paint or you draw. And I do a tiny bit of that, but I really work in a lot of different discipline, a lot of different media. Some of it's painting, some of it's drawing, very, very little bit. But I also do performance and installation and photography and printmaking. And so, you know, people say, well, how do we know a Dred Scott work is a Dred Scott work? And I tell people, well, I make revolutionary art to propel history forward. The thing that coheres all my body of work is the, the work is really asking an audience to confront a lot of the cohering ideas of American society and often imagine how the world could be radically different and far better. So in 1988, I made this piece called What is the Proper Way to Display a U.S. Flag? That was an installation for audience participation. Um, and it basically consisted of a photo montage on the wall, which I'll show you a detail of in a second, uh, books that were originally blank that people could write responses to the question that was the title of the work and a three by five foot flag that people had the option of standing on. Um, this is the detail of the, the uh, photo montage. So it has the text, the title of the work, what is the proper way to display a US flag. Below that are images of South Korean students burning American flags holding signs that say Yankee go home son of a bitch. And below that are flag draped coffins coming back from Vietnam and a troop transport. It was a piece for audience participation. So people wrote lots and lots and lots of things there. You can see some of the answers were really long. Some of them were short. Um, and it really, uh, you know, it was not just me saying fuck the flag or anything like that. It was people really grappling with what does the US flag represent? What does US patriotism represent? And what is America about? And all sorts of people, including people who felt victimized by America, whose families had been say killed by police, came and stood on Old Glory and wrote their responses. And also a lot of people sort of said, look, I should be shot and killed for doing this. So it was a real, real mix of voices. But then it got to the point where George Bush called the work disgraceful when it was on view at a, a show at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago in 1989, where I was an undergraduate student. And I said, what? The president of the United States knows I exist and he doesn't like what I'm doing? Well, right on to that. I want to do this for the rest of my life. And so this work sort of set my my art and my life on a particular mission, even though I knew that it would be unlikely that my work would be, you know, find the ire of the president or be outlawed by Congress, which this work was, um, you know, I knew that the work mattered deeply to people. And that's the kind of work I've been making ever since. Um, this is a project called On the Impossibility of Freedom in a Country Founded on Slavery and Genocide. It was a performance that was a durational performance where I walked into the high pressure water jet of a fire hose. I hired some firemen. And they turned a fire hose on me that referenced the, the fire hosing of civil rights demonstrators in Birmingham, Alabama in uh, 1963, but also it's a tactic and a form of terror that's used in lots of different places. Um, and the, the performance happened in uh, October of 2014. And so at, 
part of the time I had my hands up like that because it was a, a couple months earlier that people heard the name Mike Brown for the first time and people were demonstrating and saying hands up don't shoot because Mike Brown was killed by the police while he had his hands up. Um, this is part of slave rebellion reenactment. Now, slave rebellion reenactment, as Aaron and, and Rachel noted, was a performance that I did in 2019 that reenacted the largest rebellion of enslaved people in the history of the United States. It was a community engaged performance. So the thing that was really visible was for two days, we marched for 26 miles on the outskirts of New Orleans in the locations that, that the largest rebellion of enslaved people in US history took place. Um, and that rebellion had this bold vision of trying to seize all of Orleans territory and set up an African Republic in the new world that would have outlawed slavery much the way Haiti had done a few years earlier. But this wasn't just me hiring a bunch of actors. It was a project that actually deeply connected to the community in and around New Orleans. So we had um, sort of lunches and dinners and gatherings where we would just talk and it was talk conversations with 21st century people about why this history, this 19th century history of freedom and emancipation matter. We had dinners. I met with the Black Student Union of Tulane University, but also students from Dillard and Xavier, which were historically black colleges in and around New Orleans. We had a, a, a costume department that looked at what uh, the, the, the clothing that was described in runaway slave ads, as well as uh, lithographs from uh, San Domingue, or what became Haiti and Guadeloupe and Martinique for what enslaved people would have worn so we can actually give enslaved people back their humanity and have dress that was both more realistic but more varied than burlap sacks. Um, people had sewing circles that learned how to make costumes. There was both a professional costume department, but people made their own costumes as well as made costumes for other people. On the right, you see one of the reenactors uh, who had just learned to sew that day making his own costume. Uh, we had walking practice to make sure that we can, you know, even us weak 21st century people could walk some of the distance that the enslaved did in 1811. And so we wanted to see that. And also that when we'd walk into the communities that they wouldn't be like dogs that were off the leash that would come attack us. We had to make flags. We knew that that um, the, the um, rebel army had about 500 people because the general um, General Wade Hampton wrote to the governor, Governor Claiborne, that their 500 begins in the field, they're marching in formation under flags. So we knew this was a disciplined army, but they didn't write down what the flags were. So I had to imagine what some flags that would have united across cultures would have been. And this is an imagined uh, a flag that used a Ghanaian adinkra that literally probably wouldn't have been made, but is something, this is a symbol that means confidence and hope. Um, we had walking practice, but also practice looking like an army. We wanted to not just be a gaggle of people walking. We wanted to look like a disciplined army because that's what this was. There was an attempt to seize power of or all of Orleans territory. And so we wanted to embody freedom and emancipation that way. And these are some performance stills of what the reenactment looked like a bit. Um, these are both, you'll get a glimpse of what it was, but also these images are how the work is shown after the performance. Um, so these are shown in galleries and museums around the country. It's currently, these are currently on view in a museum, the Contemporary Art Museum of St. Louis. And this image is sort of the most important image of the performance stills because a lot of times when people think of reenactment, they think of like, look, let's get rid of the modern, let's get rid of the present. You look at civil war reenactment and they take place in a field somewhere. And I'm much more concerned as a visual artist with this clash between the past and the present. And so having this rebel slave army, the army of the enslaved sort of marching past oil refineries and with cars and all the modern stuff, they're sort of teleported from the past to liberate us in the present. And in particular, these oil refiners were literally put down on the graves of, of, on top of what was sugar plantations, but on the graves of enslaved people. So having this rebel army marching past this toxic land is really important. And this is just a video, so you can get a couple seconds of what it seemed like in, in real life in the outskirts of New Orleans.
And once we got to sort of the city itself, we sort of ruptured the historic timeline. And this is one of the scenes in, in New Orleans itself. So this is what the project looks like in, when displayed in a museum. So thousands of people saw it live, but more will see documentation of it. Um, and these are some of the flags that you see also on display. This was not a project about slavery. It was a project about black joy and liberation and freedom, um, which this reenactment was really focusing on how people were fighting to get free and the visions people had about freedom. One reenactor after the fact said, I felt like I finally got a chance to represent somebody who most people may not even know exists. And that question of if you understand that people rebelled during the times of enslavement and were fighting to get free and had bold visions of freedom and embodying that, understanding that past can enable people in the present to act differently about how we get free today. And just a couple other pieces. This is a man was lynched by police yesterday, which um, I believe Rachel uh, mentioned saying that it was a sort of an updated version of the NAACP flag that said a man was lynched yesterday that was indeed uh, flown outside their national headquarters in New York from 1920 to 1938, the day after anybody was lynched. And I took and repurposed that and sort of positioned and posited that the police are the successors and inheritors of lynch mob terror. And this is uh, my latest work, actually. It's a piece that's currently up now um, on the side of a theater in uh, New York City in, in Hell's Kitchen on 42nd Street and in, in between 9th and 10th Avenue. If you know New York, it's in Manhattan. Um, and it is just, there's actually two pieces that are up. One is a, a, a re reprinting of a piece that said, imagine a world without America that has a global map that, that America is decentered in. Um, but this is the piece that, that is the newest work. It just went up and, and was on, installed about four or five days ago. And the, beyond what I think is a really interesting pointed statement to be out in public art, um, when the theater posted and then I reposted this on Instagram, um, Instagram said that this was hate speech and suppressed it. They, they removed the post initially and it became an ongoing battle to get the piece put back up um, with, with, I mean, and, and, and Instagram even censored the National Coalition Against Censorship for, for their posting of it. And then it got to a Kafkaesque tale where I noted that they had censored this work. And then they said that was indeed hate, that my, the post commenting on the censorship was, was hate speech. And then I said, white people's algorithms can't be trusted with power. And they censored that saying that that was hate speech too. Um, eventually the post got put back up, but um, this question of rebellion, revolution, resistance, reenactment, and just sort of how power is concentrated um, and how people are fighting against it. I just wanted to leave you with this. And uh, I guess we'll stop that and Stop sharing. So that's what I got to say. And, and yeah, Aaron, let's, let's talk. All right. Now I'm unmuted. Yeah. Uh, thanks so much, Dred, for taking us through your practice as a revolutionary artist. Um, I thought we might begin by addressing your name uh, for folks who are watching. Um, you know, obviously you share a near name with Dred Scott. Um, and so I'll just leave it to you to explain how, how you came to take on this moniker as an artist. Yeah, well, I mean, I assume most people in this audience will know, but just in case there's somebody who doesn't. In 1857, there was a man named Dred Scott who had a case where he was an enslaved man and he sued for his freedom. He got taken to a territory that had uh, out, did not have slavery that was legalized and he sued for his freedom. After several back and forth cases in lower courts, it eventually wound up in the Supreme Court. And in 1857, the Supreme Court wrote a ruling um, that is the most well-articulated, developed 
argument for white supremacy that I've ever read. Um, it's 41 pages long. I highly encourage people to read it and it's deeply rooted in US law and custom and the US constitution and, and the Declaration of Independence. Um, and it was an argument that included wordings that said, there are no rights that a black person has that a white man is bound to respect. And so um, when I was a young art student and sort of a kid in the punk rock scene in Chicago, I had friends that had uh, stage names and I knew people that had stage name. I mean, I knew a cat named Virus X, um, but I also knew band members of various bands like Joey Shithead and Leaving and, and uh, other names like that. And I said, well, I need a name, even though I'm not really in a band. I was in a band, but that was crappy. So I didn't get the name for that, but I wanted a, a name for my uh, fine art. And I had dreads at the not time and, and my, my parents had named me Scott. So I said, wait a minute, I'll be Dread Scott. That's perfect. It both has the, the uh, reference to this particular bit of American history, including with an enslaved man fighting, at least in the legal system for his freedom. Um, but then I changed the spelling of the name. He spelled his name D-R-E-D and I add an A, so it's D-R-E-A-D, so it evokes, evokes the concept of dread in the fear sense, but also in the Rasta sense, even though I'm an atheist and not a Rasta, I actually like the concept of dread as a lot of the Rastas understand it. And so it was, um, yeah, that's, that's it. Thank you. Um... And I, you've also created a work of art that that builds on, on the Dred Scott case, right? Um, yeah. 2013's Dred Scott decision, and I, I'm really interested in in how your work, you know, I mean, you you prompt us to engage with historical documents and other texts that have shaped our present circumstances, but that almost no one reads, right? So, I'm I'm really curious for you just to talk a little bit about the the Dred Scott work, and then I yeah. want to go into uh, the Slave Rebellion reenactment. Yeah, well, Dred Scott decision was a performance in 2012 that was done indoors. I mean, a lot of my performances happen on the streets, but this was a piece that was commissioned for the Brooklyn Academy of Music or BAM um, in the, a, a theater that at the time was new. It was a small black box theater and it had sort of three key, key elements. One was that I read the verbatim text of the Dred Scott decision, although in honesty, I, I had edited it down not for content, but just for length, because the performance would have been about twice as long if I didn't cut it down, but it was more inline editing than it, I retained the, the flavor of it. Um, and then there were four new Black performers who were being harassed and corralled by live German Shepherd dogs and their handlers that these dogs bark the entire time. And then there was an audience who, you know, with with most theater, you think, hey, I'm going to go to the theater, I'll sit in seats, and then I'll see a, a play. And in this performance, the audience became an active participant in, in a way similar to what is the proper way to display a U.S. flag, where people, where the audience was actively part of the work. In this performance, they also became part of the work. They got lined up, um, and in sort of in, in sort of just with in some stanchions, like if, if you were going to the DMV, you'd have to wind through a snaking line. But then you, once you got to the front of that line, you had to cross through this line of black men uh, to go into a voting booth. And so they had to make a choice. Do they just walk past these men? Do they step over them when they're lying on the ground? Do they push past them? Do they look at them? Do they pretend they're not there? Um, and then they didn't know what was going to happen in the voting booth. And once they got there, there was a small sort of survey or questionnaire um, that they were asked to fill out. And it was a simple thing that said basically that America enslaved, you know, uh, millions of people, millions of you know, Afri millions of people from Africa before eight, you know, up until 1865. After that year, they continue to en enslave large sections of people and now currently imprison 13% or sorry, 12% of uh, their, their uh, uh, this, actually is the quote, right? Yeah, 12% uh, of their male, young male descendants to age 20 to 34. Um, and fully 33% of black men will be in prison at some point during their lifetime. Neither presidential candidate has any plans to stop this mass incarceration or change this legacy. A vote for either implies continuing an acceptance of that. And then ask the audience to, I state your name, will or will not vote in the upcoming presidential election in 2012. And then that 
then if you voted, you put it in a sealed envelope. You, and then if you, you know, once you cast your ballot, then you received an artwork that asked you to extend dialogue about the work into your home. Um, and so, you know, it was, you know, as you mentioned, my work mines a lot of history. So there was the particular history of the Dred Scott decision, which I think, as I said, people should read that. It is actually very, it's foundational text to understanding the United States of America. Um, and it, but my work often looks at how the past sort of sets the stage for the present, but how it resides in the present in new form. And so this piece was saying there is a real connection between slavery, that ruling in 1857, and mass incarceration today. And I knew that an audience coming to see my work would generally think, oh yeah, you know, slavery is bad and even mass incarceration is bad. But the question of how does, how does voting stop or change that? Because it did actually take a war to end slavery. It wasn't even a moralistic thing. It's not as if the North decided in 18, you know, 40, you know, the slavery thing is really messed up. We're gonna invade the South to stop that. That's not what happened. That's not at all what happened, but it did actually take a war to end slavery. And now people are thinking, well, look, I got a chance to vote for Barack Obama or somebody else. You know, that that is gonna, you know, represent my aspirations. And yet it's not going to end mass incarceration. That would not, that was not on the ballot. And, you know, much the way slavery ending that, abolishing that was not on the ballot in 1862 or 1852 or 1832 or 1822. Um, and so if you kind of confront that, then it's like, well, what do you do? What, what is it going to take to, to make the world the way you would prefer it to be? Which again, much of my audience has some you know, general agreement that you know, white supremacy is probably not such a good thing. But then people, what do you do to, to act on that? Because if all you're doing is voting, that is not going to change the world in the way that you want it to be changed. Um, and in fact, is part of keeping things the same in, in, in many ways. And so um, that work, you know, was, was really grappling with, let's talk about a country whose democracy is, has its roots in slavery. That's what America is. I mean, a lot of times people like to talk about, oh, the founding fathers and we the people. And it's like, well, actually, fundamentally, this was a country that was founded on slavery and genocide. That's what this is. And even the founding fathers, they're conception of freedom was predicated upon owning people. There's not, it's not that radical a vision of freedom and it's outmoded. And if we're trying to go back to that and try and mine that for something good, you're, it's a rotten foundation. This country is rotten to its core and it's founding documents and conception. And, you know, I, I was hoping that Dred Scott decision would help people engage and confront that and then, you know, act on that morality. Yeah, I love how the piece uh, really forces people to confront the limits of electoral politics. Um, something very, it's very difficult for people to um, think, you know, think outside of or, or beyond. I'm really uh, fascinated by the way that your work kind of constellates the past and the present um, and, and the future as well, right? Insofar as you get us to confront the ways that enslaved people, um, you know, nominally free Black people and their co-conspirators, um, you know, prefigured abolitionist ways of being, um, you know, prior to the Civil War and, and after, you know, after formal emancipation, right, which was not, not real freedom. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm really curious about the response to, you um, the slave rebellion reenactment in particular, um, you know, you, you talked about bringing, bringing that rebellion into the present space, right? The, the, you know, we could see in that image, the oil refineries in the background. And, you know, we know that this, this area of Louisiana is now known as Cancer Alley, um, just outrageous rates of, of disease and illness. Um, because of, of, you know, extraction and the fossil fuel industry. And I actually didn't know that photographs from this reenactment were being shown in galleries. So I'm really interested mm. in how you see the, the photographs working alongside the actual live reenactment. Um, and, you know, especially seeing these images of Black Rebellion um, in, in, you know, museum or art institutions, which are themselves, you know, quite conservative. Um, I wonder how you, how you see this reenactment 
continuing um, within these spaces or beyond them? Yeah, um, well, I mean, the first thing is response to the work as work. And so for, there were kind of really two audiences. One was the audience that sees the work live, but the other is the audience that's the, the, the reenactors themselves. I mean, these were people that were embodying freedom and emancipation. And the, the you know, video I showed with the, that was mostly young women and, and gender non-conforming people that were saying, ashe, ashe, liberté, liberté. That, you know, them as their own audience, that's, I mean, the chance to embody freedom that way to feel, I mean, it was the most liberated space I've actually been in. And, um, you know, it, where people, I mean, you know, we brought an army of the enslaved with prop weapons, but nonetheless weapons into a major metropolitan city and said, we're going to end slavery, you know, onto New Orleans, we're going to end slavery, join us, um, you know, freedom or death. And, and it was both a call from the past, but about the present too. And people felt profoundly transformed and very strong. And, you know, it, I mean, even, um, you know, the, one of the things in rehearsals, I mean, we had these really great costumes. And when we rehearsed sort of being an army of the enslaved, you know, we had to, we had to train people on how to handle prop weapons, um, both to look sort of militant, but also to, if we encountered white supremacists or others that were trying to disrupt the performance. And this, you know, this, this performance took place in a region of the country that had a lot of white supremacists. I mean, it wasn't all of what the New Orleans area is, but there are, you know, Confederate flags flying in people's backyards and people that walk around with guns and have been, you know, firebomb people taking down Confederate monuments. and in fire, you know, firebomb churches, black churches. And so, you know, we had to exude this militancy, but also um, be non-threatening in an individual confrontation way to not escalate things. So we had to de-escalate. But anyway, so we had these rehearsals and I would tell people, look, your costume's not complete until you have some weapon. And for some people, it was really, I mean, I, some of some young women, some of the women were like, it felt very liberating for them. I mean, including some that had had, um, you know, violence done against them that was enforced by guns in the house of fathers or lovers or brothers or whatever, to actually for them to pick up a weapon was very powerful, even if it was a prop weapon. And even there was, a, I remember this young one, woman who actually been had, you know, had violence used against her by some man and she couldn't she, she was so viscerally opposed to it she the only way she could say was like look i can't do that but she had like this little pair of scissors that that was like that was enough but by the end she had her hand on a machete um and it was this thing of people really like feeling wait this is a political act of you know trying to collectively get free and then the connections they made with other people those and so that you know that that response, which is somewhat internal to the the, the reenactment, it was essential to why it was being done. It wasn't just spectacle for outsiders, even though it was spectacle for outsiders, and was very important for that. And then the question of um, and it was and for the for the outsiders who saw it, I mean, it was largely people thought this was you know the, one of the most amazing things they've seen and then some people didn't like it some people were like quick hide the children the black people, the black people are coming um and and some of it was interesting i mean some of the, like the kids thought it was sort of like a parade and they were dancing and st stuff to it which you know there's a parading culture in the new orleans area but some of the, the you know white parents were like i don't know about this this is kind of scary um but largely it was well received um now putting it in museums i mean i you know it's 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 obviously extremely different than seeing it live live there is a visceral connection to live performance which is why i do a lot of live performance um and seeing photographs even large photographs is different than that that said it is you know museums are somewhat contested spaces. They're conservative in some ways, but it is one of the few areas in society where you can have some of the dialogue, li like around slave rebellion reenactment, that you you aren't 
you know, by and large, they're not having conversations about this on the, you know, the floor of Amazon in, in their shipping center or in, you know, Google's headquarters or in even, you know, many departments at universities. I mean, yes, some of the history departments they are, but by and large, I don't think the chemists are having that conversation, except if they go to a museum, which tourists and school kids and all sorts of people get dragged to museums. Some go because they like it, others get dragged there. I was, a, as a young kid, I was dragged to museums once a year. Um, I was a middle-class kid, so that's what, you know, people in the middle class do. And it's not like I was like this kid who loved painting, but if I had seen work like this, I would have had a different experience of like, maybe I'd want to go to a museum more. So it is possible to contest within these spaces. And, and with works like, you know, what is the proper way to display a US flag or a man was lynched by police yesterday? I mean, going to the Whitney Museum and seeing a man was lynched by police yesterday, it changes the conversation that you were going to have when you go to this space. It doesn't change the fact that the boards that oversee museums are often, you know, multimillionaires and billionaires. And some of them are, you know, weapons manufacturers and, and, and Trump supporters that, that I, I understand that, but it is also a space where these kind of dialogues can, you know, be sort of positioned so that, you know, people can then say, oh, you know, armed black people in New Orleans, what is this about? Let's, let's talk about that. They had a vision for getting free. What does that mean for the present? Yeah, I so I asked the question about, um, you know, the photographs being in, in art galleries and museums, because, you know, I, I studied photography and I was mm. thinking about a recent conversation um, in the abolition feminism conversation, um, you know, in this series with Beth Ritchie and um, actually, I'm sorry, it, it wasn't the abolition feminism one, it was the one on uh, settler colonialism um, with Kelly Little Hernandez and um, just thinking about um, the, you know, thinking about the conversation about data that that was really at the center of, of that discussion and, and the ways that data, you know, this, this focus on evidence and data and I mean, just thinking about the, the closing comments in the in the Chauvin trial um, yesterday, you know, the, the prosecution's emphasis on the video and, and knowing what we saw, knowing that what we what we saw, you know, there was this assumption that we all saw the same thing, that we all perceived the video in the same way. And, um, you know, photography and, and data are sort of wedded in that way and that they teach us to read the read the world as sort of uh, fact based and just kind of, you know, it is the way it is. Um, and of course, you know, photography has taught us to naturalize race in, in many ways. So, you know, I'm just thinking about the um, ways that ways that we engage photographs differently, um, ways that we can read them as performances. Um, and so I, I'm just interested in that in that tension in your work. Um, but even more than that, I'm, I'm really interested in, in your performance spaces, like the performances that you um, are involved in generating as a kind of space of aesthetic education, right, where we are learning how to visualize abolition and how to, um, I mean, Perhaps visualizing abolition, um, you know, isn't, you know, I'm thinking about Nick Mirzoff's uh, discussion of, of visualization as a tool of surveillance, as a mechanism of control, right? So we're not just visualizing abolition, we're learning to sense abolition and, and feel it in many ways. Um, and just thinking about the, you know, the students and young people who are involved in the slave rebellion reenactment and the kind of slow process of preparing for it, you know, sewing sewing their clothing and, you know, engaging in skill shares and, you know, that the work that that's the work, right, of, mm -hmm. of in taking, working with this history and embodying it. Um, and, you know, the process of working through one's, you know, ostensibly private trauma from, you know, this, the, you're just speaking about this woman who had experienced domestic abuse in her home and, you know, in, engaging in this reenactment. Um, being able to work through some of that trauma, I think is, is a really interesting response. Um, I have attended a, a lynching reenactment in Georgia, mm. uh, the Morse Ford lynching reenactment that's been happening um, for roughly the last decade or so. And the whole point of that reenactment, uh, well, so it's a reenactment of a 1946 massacre of, of four people, two couples. Um, in Monroe, Georgia, and the reenactments began because activists and politicians were trying to um, 
reopen an investigation into this lynching because you know people who had participated in it were still alive and you know it had been one of the lynchings that MLK was really invested in in you know solving um, before he was assassinated. So these reenactments have been happening and you know people are often really confused by them like how you know they ask how is it that embodying this kind of pain painful history um, and, and restaging um, restaging a, a lynching that was actually not done in this kind of spectacular way that we associate with lynchings, right? It was done sort of on the side of the road in kind of, you know, off, off a main street. There wasn't necessarily a big thousand person strong mob present for that particular killing, but, um, you know, people have questioned the way that this reenactment potentially spectacularizes um, black pain. And so, um, you know, I've been really attentive to the kind of surprising moments in that, in those, in those reenactments where, you know, I'm remembering, for example, one time, um, one of the speeches by Herman Talmadge, who was the white supremacist governor of Georgia in the 1940s, you know, he openly called for uh, the murders of, of black people as, as Herman Wallace and you know other progressives in the country were building, attempting to build a, a voter drive right through the South in the 1940s, so so one of the actors in the reenactment was uh, performing Herman Talmadge's speech where he's calling for white folks in Monroe to outright kill black people and two uh, white townspeople in Monroe passed by as the speech was being delivered and and they were totally shocked and. You know, I watched them, they stopped and I think it took them a minute to realize that it was a performance and they, you know, they actually stepped in and were invested in, um, you know, troubling what they, what they saw as, as a kind of real life situation. Um, and then there are other moments, you know, within this, it's a, it's a lot of students coming from outside of Georgia, you know, a lot of black students, young, young black folk who are learning about this history. Um, so I'm just really interested in these spaces, you know, the idea that a reenactment can be a site of aesthetic education that's not invested in, um, you know, the education of the individual rational universal subject, but, you know, cultivating a kind of collective um, vision, right, and, and desire for, for revolution. I wonder, uh, before we go to audience questions, if you could just say a little bit about the work that you have in Barring Freedom, because I'm really fascinated by the work that you've done for the show or that you've included in the show. Yeah, I'll, I'll talk about that in a second, but I want to bookmark one thing because it would be good for you to come back to your, and again, I suspect this audience is pretty sophisticated and knows a lot, but you said, oh, this wasn't a lynching that had thousands of people that came to it people might not understand what lynchings were and how they were carried out. So it might make sense for you after I talk a little bit about what's in Barring Freedom to just dip a toe in the pool of what lynchings were and why many lynching had hundreds and thousands of people at them. Um, and so, uh, you know, I, the, the, in, in Barring Freedom, I mean, one of the, the, the there are a couple pieces. And actually I think that, that um, uh, uh, Chloe can maybe bring them up as I talk about them. One is a piece called Stop, um, which is a video, it's a projected video that has two, um, two walls. They're, they're, uh, it's part of a larger project where I worked with, collaborated with some, uh, um, an artist in, in Liverpool, UK, um, and with young adults, mostly men, but men and women in, uh, East New York, Brooklyn, and in a similar neighborhood in uh, Liverpool. And the thing about East New York, when we, we were doing this piece in 2012, and uh, East New York was the highest concentration of stop and frisk. Uh, the police, where the police would just like jump out and stop people and harass youth for no reason whatsoever, and, and sometimes arrest and sometimes brutalize, and in some cases kill. Uh, youth, but in, in uh, East New York was the highest concentration in the country. And some of the people there, I mean, like, I think 83% of the residents were stopped every year. But what that meant was that the, you know, 90 year old grandmother wasn't stopped at all. And some of the guys that I worked with were stopped 100 times or 200 times. And so stop was a, a projected video that has uh, young men from the UK and young men from uh, Brooklyn, each just standing still 
and repeating the number of times they've been stopped by the police, whether it's 15 or 35 or 100 or, or 200. And I mean, these are filmed, they almost look like they could be an ad for like United Colors of Benetton or something like that. Um, and and it's it's just it's very heavy. And one of the things when when the piece was done, I mean, the, you know, it was, it was part of like a year long work with with uh, these these young people, and you know, the, their parents, you know, knew a little bit of the statistics, but they didn't know how much it affected their children. So when this was shown at the gallery, and the, you know, it was an opening, and people came and. And it was like, wow, I did it really put faces to the statistics and the, and the trauma and the horror of what it meant to be growing up young and black or brown in America. I mean, at any time, but particularly in the, the uh, you know, 19, sort of, you know, 20, 2008 through 2012 or something like that. Um, and then two other works in the show are, one is um, a piece called Wild Black um, and another is Wild White. I'll just stay on Wild Black for a second as people could see um, it's, a, it's a diptych, it's two screen prints that are 30 inches by 22 inches each. And the left side um, is things that the police, that white people called cops were that black people were doing. So they're just like going, you know, going to a college, well, colleging while black or swimming while black or Starbucking while black or uh, having a screaming child while black or driving while black or sitting in your own damn house. And so white people called armed men to come harass and in some, in some cases with the result of killing black people for just being while black and then the right side is hashtags that perhaps black people think or perhaps white people think that black people think like hashtag wanting to kill white people while black hashtag wanting to burn it all down while black hashtag wanting to have lots of guns wanting to get the fuck out of here wanting to watch the empire fall have hashtag wanting to kill the president while black hashtag wanting to throw blankers from windows while black and wanting to be free while black and so it's and then uh, uh, that was made in 2018 and then in 2020 I made Wild White, which um, is basically the red, white, and blue version of hashtag hunting a black man, Wild White, hashtag calling the police, Wild White, hashtag not social distancing, Wild White, hashtag getting a job you're unqualified for, Wild White, getting accepted into your parents' college, standing your ground, being presumed innocent, avoiding blame, and up through getting away with murder, thinking only of yourself, lying while white, and living while white. Um, and so that's just what's in there and um, yeah, so that's that's my work. But I do think it would be good, Aaron, to just talk a little little bit more about lynching because it is so, you know, it is, you know, you don't get modern day America without slavery, but you also don't get here without lynching and the terror that that was and, and all, and even this thing of like, you know, white people sort of stopping or people stopping and getting educated through reenactment, that's interesting, but this thing, it, that that you know you said that that the calls for the murder of black people by a politician is is something that is a bit you know it, it, it's almost of the past and in a certain sense people don't know how literal that was done but in the present there are you know politicians that are sending money to uh Rittenhauer's defense and saying you've done nothing wrong, cops who are doing that. And so it's, it is a thing of the past and there is a particularity when there is a lynch mob versus organized state sanctioned violence. Um, you know, there is a difference when the police are doing the lynching openly as opposed to how it was done in collaboration with the police in the 1910s and 20s and 30s. But, um, but I think, but it, it, lynching is, you, you don't get modern America without lynching from the really 1865 up through 1965 or 70 and even into the present and then it's police incarceration so just talking briefly about you know why there were lynch mobs of 10,000 people what that meant mm -hmm. yeah I mean the the title of this event is reenacting revolution and you know the reconstruction period was one of the most revolutionary periods in American history and of course we've you know we've had a white supremacist um history of that period that has told us that, uh, you know, the South was threatened by so-called Negro domination, uh, when in reality, you know, formerly enslaved people and their, their radical co-conspirators were, you know, building the first public schools in the South, um, you know, and trying to really stave off the, I guess, the, the, the spread of, of capitalism in, in the South, right? People were working together 
farmers are working together to, you know, maintain their practices of subsistence farming so they wouldn't be forced into, you know, selling their labor or, um, you know, being indebted or, you know, being caged and then bailed out by, um, you know, by a big boss and forced to labor. Um, it was an, it was an incredibly revolutionary period, and because it was it was a revolutionary period that threatened the ruling class in the South, right, the former planter class, uh, they responded with incredible violence, and they engaged in in massacres, um, you know, all all over all over the South, um, and and not just in the South, right. And so by the 1880s and 1890s, we have, or you know, really the, the end of the 1870s, the federal government withdraws from um, you know, abandons federal reconstruction, abandons the project of radical reconstruction. Um, and, you know, then we have the, the return to power of the white supremacist Democrats and the emergence of, of a kind of, um, you know, slightly, slightly uh, recalibrated ideology or notion of blackness, right, which is blackness as a form of criminal humanity, right, which which we first get under slave law, um, you know, codifying enslaved humanity as criminal, but really emerges into the public um, in, you know, after after reconstruction, um, with these spectacular public torture spectacles, which, you know, it wasn't like people were just being hanged and shot at, um, they, they were long drawn out um, events, right, and people were I mean, newspapers advertise them ahead of time, trains were specially commissioned, tens of thousands of people would gather, would, would travel to picnic at these public lynchings, um, which you know, took the form of shootings and hangings and burnings um, and draggings, right? Texas has a tradition of dragging, which we saw with the James Byrd lynching in 1998. Now that's an old, old practice um, so it's, you know, it's not a coincidence that dragons happen in particular areas of the country. Um, and so, you know, lynching really is, is the, the framework through which, or the lens through which Americans have come to accept, you know, or come to this unconscious <laughs> notion of blackness as inherently criminal. Um, and so when we talk about slavery and incarceration, you know, the, this history, this long history of racial terror often falls out of it. And it's really through um, you know, the, the publicness of this racial terror and its recirculation um, through, the, through the photographs that people have, have learned to, to see, right, to see Blackness in a, in a very particular way. And so it's really important to understand the relationship of racial terror to slavery and to our present um, and to also interrogate, you know, the ways that the law relies on extra legal violence, right? The state has never had a monopoly on violence in the United States. Uh, you know, establishment power has, or I guess the ruling class has only been able to maintain power um, because of the participation of vigilante and paramil paramilitary organizations, right? That have um, participated in, in this violence. So when we talk about, you know, the police participation in lynch mobs, I mean, lynch mobs, in my mind, are always already police, right? They are only police. They, I mean, that's an indication of, um, you know, really the, the kind of foundational structure of whiteness in this country, which was tasked with, I mean, mandated really with the fugitive slave law in 1850 to surveil and arrest black people. Like all white people had to participate in that. Um, and, you know, we, we move on and, and you know, enter into the 20th century and, you know, black radicals in the 1920s and 30s were like, hey, you know, this is a, a mode of violence in which, um, you know, against the kind of commonsensical idea that it was backward folks in the South who were doing this, it was actually lawyers and business owners and police who were, you know, organizing these mobs. And of course they weren't always organized, um, but, you know, even, even when they weren't organized, they were, um, or when they were more spontaneous, right? Um, they were still being being supported by by people in, in power. Um, so you know, in the 1930s, black radicals initiated really this this kind of deepened analysis of the state's involvement in lynching, and they started calling they started calling uh, or using the term lynch law, right, to describe the power that threatened to annihilate the lives of the Scottsboro Nine, right? These nine young men who um, were falsely accused of raping two 
young white women and um, you know that that discourse really really took off in the 1930s right this, and, and it was lynch law um, as, as well as the term legal lynching right to talk about um, the the preponderance of, of uh, executions right by the state of, of black people which continues today um, and so you know I when I first saw your flag uh, dread the a man was lynched by police today you know, that was 2015 right it was shortly after yeah. the killing of yeah. Michael Brown and you know I had been using this language to talk about this kind of violence for a while and so when you know, your, your flag is, is one example of a kind of um, maybe non-figurative citation of lynching culture that I think is really helpful um, to get people to have a, an expanded uh, analysis of, of, you know, how central this violence has been. Um, and I would love to talk, hear more about people's responses to that flag, but I do want to bring us up to the present and talk about talk about the, you know, everything that's been happening the last few weeks, the, the verdict that um, was announced today and the killing of Dante Wright and the killing of Adam Toledo. Um, I actually, you know, I was preparing for this event. So I, it was literally about 20 minutes before it started that I saw yeah. that yeah. Chauvin had been convicted. And, you know, I, I knew it was coming. Really, I think he's uh, been elected the fall boy, right, for, for policing in this country. And, you know, it's, for those of you who watched the, the trial, I mean, the police officers who testified against him made it very clear that they were setting him up to take the fall so that they could put forth this image that, um, you know, policing can be reformed and there are good apples in, in, the, uh, in the police department in Minnesota. And, you know, we, we know that the targeting or punishing individual police officers for what is a, a structural problem is not going to end policing. <laughs> it's not going to end police violence. In fact, I think that this, this verdict, this conviction might actually do more harm to um, movements against policing if we're not really careful about how we articulate justice um, and, and what justice means, right? So it's really important to continue this kind of ideological battle, right? With um, reformers, people who want to fix the system that is killing us. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I mean, I think it's the, the the verdict of guilty for for Chauvin is very important. It's a step in the right direction, but it ain't justice. And and I think the, the, looking at the systemic nature of it, you see that, you know, after the murder of Dante Wright, the first thing Joe Biden says is now is not that you know there's no excuse for violence. He didn't tell that to the cops. He told that to the people. Who were at the point being standing up to you know flashbang grenades and 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 you know riot shields and and cops that were you know they just murdered somebody and they were like god damn it we are going to defend and expand that even in the midst of the Derek Chauvin trial so you know I, I think the verdict is really important and and uh, you know only came about because people being in the streets day after day after day after day in you know May and, and June of last year and, and demanding that Black Lives Matter, but it's like yeah we've got, you know, the the, the police are like oh yeah we got this we you know it's like if you kneel on somebody's neck on camera, um, with a whole crowd of people telling you that he can't breathe that's unacceptable. But yeah you could still shoot people you could still beat them you, you can run the lie that you know with Adam Toledo that you know oh he had a gun and so we had to shoot this 13 year old boy and then have your prosecutors get up and repeat that lie and and all this kind of stuff so it's like no I don't think the police are are backed off at all I think that there's a tremendous fight that people have to have and and you know my personal view is this you know the police will continue to murder and brutalize people as long as a system and a society that needs police to enforce relations of exploitation exists. There's not going to be any, you know, freedom from that terror until the system is overthrown. But that's a much longer conversation. Um, I don't know. We I don't know we could solve that tonight. But it would be good to to you know hear hear from some of the audience questions and get into it. But yeah. So let's should we should we bring in. Yeah. in uh, Let's invite uh, Gina and Rachel back and we can talk about how to continue reenacting revolution um, yeah. in this time. Gina, do you mind if I jump in with a question really Go fast? For it. I, yeah, so not to just, you know, walk in, but you know, one of the things that I was thinking about was the, this kind of aesthetic education, Erin, that you raised, this idea of the aesthetic education and what we're, what's being taught in those spaces is not just to kind of 
the reading of history and the understanding it through the body and the lived experience, but particularly around protest, right? That, that actually there's something that you're getting to in these two sites, I think of both the spectacle, the crowd that gathers around, um, around the, lynch, the site of the lynching, who's composed that, who composes that crowd, who takes part, right? Because the crowd is of course the actors, which we see reenacted on January 6th. So here's the reenactment, right? And then what you do, Dread, which is like a turning around where you're finding the protests that lead to a different kind of, in, a different kind of body, right, of that. So I was just thinking about this as if what is the education here? If you wanna talk more about what it is to actually train people to pro in protest through the art. Yeah, I mean, you know, it, it's protest, but it's also, it's it's more than that in a certain sense. I mean, protest is really important both as within art, but also more broadly, people need to be in the streets. People have to fight for, for justice. That's really important. But one of the things with slave rebellion reenactment is it it actually got people to, to um, both look at the past and actually look at a t revolution. I mean, the, the people, in 1811, they weren't trying to protest enslavement. They were trying to overthrow enslavement. They were trying to seize power and outlaw slavery by, in, in a, by establishing an African Republic in the regions that was, is now modern day New Orleans at the time was Orleans territory. And people actually seeing that's potentially, at least at that point, that was the only way those people could get free. It's not like you could have just protested being whipped a few too many times. That was not going to work in every modern day person. If they think about it for a half second, it's like, oh yeah, the only way people could get free is, well, maybe they could have escaped, but then even then you still got a system of enslavement. They're gonna be hunted. So you actually have to overthrow that system, which is what this radical vision of people in 1811 had. And so embodying that and getting people to think about that and then think, what are the what does that mean in our present? That visioning of what how both how change did happen and how change could happen is really important. So I mean there is protest, but it's also a, a sort of philosophical, political, and ideological thing of getting people to imagine a radically different future and the means to get there. And that is, I think, you know, extremely important. And I think this thing of um you know, there, there are a lot of artists who are starting to grapple with, and people I'm sure outside of the arts, but I happen to know the arts more, who are really challenging people to like, what sort of future do you want? How do we get there? What could that be? And, you know, some of it's really idealist of just like, you know, pretending that, that you know, that capitalism and white supremacy don't exist in the present and we can just live in some alternate reality and that'll all be good there is a real strain of it of like, well, actually, if all we're thinking about is demonstrating and calling, you know, the pigs pigs, which people should call the pigs pigs, but it's, you know, it's, if all we're doing is focusing on the present and we're not thinking about what sort of future do we want? What sort of social relations do we want? If we transform the economy away from capitalism, we we got to a socialist society aiming towards communism, what would that be? What relations could you have? What ideas would need to change that are tied to this present that we need? You know, I mean, even, you know, I, I did a work called Imagine a World Without America, which was, it's not a performance, but it's actually encouraging people to think of a world without everything that you know of America in it. And it opens possibilities for people to imagine a different future. And so slave rebellion reenactment was really positing both a question of a liberating army as a means to get free, but also the dreams of what would you do with freedom. And so there is protest and the, the, the piece was, you know, occurring in 2019 during real drives towards fascism and white supremacy in America and taking this, you know, army of the enslaved into sort of do battle ideologically in a certain sense and protesting, but it was really an expansive joyous vision that people were kind of internalizing about freedom and thinking about and working for years, thinking about what, what is freedom and how do we get it? Yeah, I think um, I was thinking about the, the Weeksville um, performance, the, the reenactment of Henry Highland Garnett's speech and you know the work that you've done dread to reenact this rebellion in, in Louisiana. 
and I was just thinking about the the etymological roots of the word sedition because that that speech right was was termed seditious speech. Um, so that you know it comes from from the Latin for mutinous separation, right? And and so yeah, we're not we're not looking to make these small fixes, right? And and this idea of a of a complete overthrow often just leaves people feeling completely helpless, right? But when we think about what it takes to carve out, you know, perhaps we might call them autonomous spaces for, for living abolition now, right? For making this kind of prefigurative um, revolutionary way of being and thinking present, um, you know, present to each other and to ourselves and to, you know, future generations. Um, it, it might be helpful to remember that root, right? That, um, you know, we can't necessarily overthrow all these systems today or tomorrow, um, but we can, you know, carve out little micro political spaces within them, right, in which we create together this infrastructure um, for, for engaging with har harms that we do to each other, right, because we do, we will harm each other, and, and we, we will always harm each other, and so we need to figure out how to, um, you know, face that harm and face each other in ways that, that don't end in, in punishment. Um, and so, you know, I, I still, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm remembering, you know, kind of mid 20th century calls by, by radical anti-lynching activists to, to kill lynchers, right? And I mean, that's a real impulse. You know, it's a real impulse within us to, to punish those who have done us harm. And so I have no problem with the image of Chauvin rotting in a jail cell <laughs> or, you know, experiencing violence inside of a prison. But I also know that that, that impulse to, you know, desire that kind of, of vengeance is, is part of the problem, right? So, so even as we celebrate um, in some small way, this very small, I don't even want to, want to call it a victory, but, you know, some people are acknowledging it as a victory, just that we keep our eyes on, um, you know, the, the, larger, the larger project of, of abolition um, and continuing to carve out you know, mutinous, <laughs> mutinous spaces um, for bringing otherwise worlds into being. That was amazing. And it is entirely appropriate to be having this conversation with the two of you today. Um, I feel fortunate that this is our schedule because otherwise we might be elsewhere. <laughs> but I, um, I, I do want to, just use, I guess, my, my few moments to invite you to close in some ways. And I want to touch on a couple of things that I believe that you've done here that are really important. Um, one thing that Aaron was talking about is the celebration. And I think the celebration that we can have is that we have a new terrain of struggle based on the fact that we've had 30 years of activism in the wake of what happened with Rodney King, which has reshaped uh, and reorganized visuality um, through intense work um, at, that you all have been part of and have been speaking about tonight. So I wanna thank you for that. And I also want to acknowledge um, all of the people who've been a part of that. And of course, that means the work is not done. It's, an, it's a new terrain for us to work from. And I think that's what I would celebrate is all of that work that has been done to get us to here. I would also just like to point out that um, you both did things that are really important for advancing the conversation and that are somewhat unique in terms of how people approach these issues, um, lynch law, police violence, historical, slavery, contemporary um, incarceration. And one thing that you raised, Aaron, was the uh, attention to other negatively racialized communities and the forms of violence that they've been subjected to and how we should be thinking together about the full spectrum of um, state violence and, um, and the accompanying um, uh, non-state uh, uh, part of that, whether or not we think of that as non-state is a whole other question, which I don't have time to ask you. Uh, and um, and for Dread, I, I, in particular, I want to focus back on your piece for Barring Freedom, because I think it's a great offering to that exhibition, because it um, really frames this as not only a US conversation. And as we, we all know um, it, here, that is uh, one of the problems of the movement is that we have been very much myopically focused 
in the um, in the language of the contemporary hegemony in the United States, only on ourselves and on our own histories. And while I'm very, very pleased that we're in a time where we have an activist uh, engagement with history, and as you put it, dread a clash between the pre past and the present, um, I also think that it's really important that we start to understand what uh, how to how to engage with the effects in other places and to hear from and learn from um, those other environments. So I want to thank you two for doing that for us. And I'm wondering if anything that I've said here inspires you to make a closing comment of any kind. Yeah, I'll go, I'll go first. Um, I guess I'll just say that, you know, I, with all of the um, anti-Asian attacks that have been happening the last year, I've been thinking about, or, you know, really observing people, you know, talking about these attacks and, and not, you know, really ha struggling to embed them in, in history. And so just, just thinking about all of the, the programs for, for anti-Asian removal um, that are so much a part of the history of California and settler colonialism in California, um, you know, violence against, genocidal violence against indigenous people and, you know, Latinx people in California um, really set the stage for the kinds of arguments that um, the planter class mobilized in the in the reconstruction and post reconstruction period. Um, to justify the lynchings of, of, of black Americans and so just thinking about you know how important it is to attend to the histories and, and thinking about you know Chinatowns didn't just emerge out of nowhere right they they are a result of genocidal campaigns against Chinese uh, and Chinese American workers who were in California, you know, building infrastructure, building railroads. And, um, you know, just that it's really important to be grounding what's happening right now in, in that history and as part of this complex of racial terror that, um, you know, has targeted many different groups of people in this country. And I think that, I mean, it, you know, is a real, real call. I mean, when Gina was talking about sort of looking outside of the borders of America, both outside and inside the borders, people actually both looking at the history, but the history, in a sort of, honestly, of what we have in common of people, um, you know, the, the, I mean, America was a country that was founded on slavery and genocide. It basically committed genocide against the native and indigenous populations, stole their land, and then brought people from West Africa to work that land. And it convinced white people, including broke ass white people to side with capitalism and that set up against the people that were being exploited most brutally. And, um, you know, I think that people, including, you know, black and brown and yellow people need to decide, <laughs> are we gonna continue to side with America and think like damn Americans, or are we going to actually think like people who have nothing in common with an exploitative oppressive society and look towards how we can get to a world where we can relate as freely associating human beings. And I do think there's a real question of people looking internationally because I mean, you know, the, the history, you know, even, you know, that history of, well, importing people from Senegambia and, and Benin and Dahomey, you know, Dahomey to work land, you know, in the United States and, and also in the Caribbean. And, you know, it's like the, the way, the way we think of, oh, they're black people in Brazil. Well, there were Africans that were brought to, to take over after the indigenous people were largely wiped out in large regions of the South and Central America and the Caribbean. And so, you know, learning from those different struggles and the commonality we can have today instead of being pitted against each other, um, you know, is really important. And I think we have a lot of work to do. There's a lot of ignorance. Um, I will cop to it myself, uh, you know, but, but there's also a real basis. And I, you know, there was, I, I can't remember the exact uh, sort of slogan, but there was a, a sign from the the uh, 1960s, I think it was like a Black Panther demonstration. It was somebody who said "Yellow Peril" for the Black Panther Party or something. I've got I've got the sign slightly wrong, but um, it was basically Asian people saying, "Look, we're standing with the Black Liberation Movement," and you know, particularly at this point of you know, 
anti-Asian violence that, that it'd be very important for black people to say, no, nah, we ain't gonna be played into demonizing the Asian people. There are sisters and brothers and we stand with them against this society, which is sort of enabling violence and terror to be able to be meted out against them. And together we could be a lot stronger in getting rid of this overall oppressive monster of a society. And um, and so, yeah, we've got some learning to do. And But it, you know, part of the foundation I encourage people is just don't think like Americans. If you're thinking like Americans, you've already lost. If you actually say we step outside of that, then we can find pe people both within the US borders, but also outside of the US borders that we can learn a lot from, including you know the the radical traditions that that you know can can help you know can help people get free in the present so i'll leave it with that i just wanted to say if do i have a couple minutes or a minute um i just wanted to say i just wanted to respond to stop your work stop in in barring freedom because i think that this that this piece actually does I mean, it opens up this conversation right beyond the borders of the us in ways that are really important right so we see you know, young black people who have been harassed by police um, speaking to each other from Brooklyn and, and Liverpool, right? And these are really important locations in the history of abolition, right? In, in the long hundreds year uh, movement for abolition. And so, you know, call, calling us into these conversations in this way, um, in the way that this installation work does, I think is really important. And I also love how you mobilize um, you know, the pause or kind of waiting, right? This kind of still time, there's a lot of kind of dead time or negative time in, in, in the videos. And I think that um, it's really important to give us, give us that space to think um, and to be with, uh, you know, this, the work, the, the slow everyday work of abolition. Um, and it's, it's so hard to, 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 to just, Accept that this is life's work, you know, and we probably will not see um, the the full outcome of it, obviously. Um, but you know, as we've seen the last year, there has been a lot born of of the abolitionist labor that um, you know m many people who are involved in this program have been engaging in for so long. So thank you. Yeah, but I mean, talking about Liverpool and history, I mean, it's both sides. I mean, because the thing with and, and both the present, but the history is like. Liverpool was really essential to sort of slavery. And, and, and actually they have, there's an international slavery museum in Liverpool that's actually acknowledging and looking at that. But I mean, the, the, the triangle of the, the transatlantic trade, I mean, it was, you know, boats went from Africa, bringing Africans to the Americas, dropped off people in the Americas, picked up cotton, which was then taken to Liverpool to be working in the, 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 the looms in Liverpool. And so the working class in Liverpool was, you know, parasitically benefiting from the huge cotton production, which was 75% of the world's cotton was produced in the United States uh, by enslaved labor. Um, and so the wealth that was being extracted from the working class in Liverpool um, was based on the slavery in the US. And then those boats then went down to, to, you know, to, to take some of that money to buy Africans that were then, it was this circular thing. But so there's both the abolitionist movement, but also the, the parasitism of capitalism including that Marx and Engels talked about, because one of the things with Liverpool, that's a lot of where Engels was, you know, that's where his, you know, factories, Liverpool and Manchester were based and where Marx was really studying the working class of, of Liverpool and got some stuff wrong, including how, it, I mean, how it was tied to the, the enslavement in the US, but got a lot of stuff right, actually. And so that, that you know, the gift of capital and the book capital and, and, you know, merges out of some of that intertwinedness and interconnectedness. But then you look at the present, it's like the way Liverpool is today, why there are all these South Asian and, and Afro descendant people in Liverpool who are catching the same hell that black youth are catching in, in East New York and Brooklyn and how they're so intertwined is based on that history. And then there's the history of people, including those youth saying, look, we don't wanna go out like that. We want We want a different future. And so, you know, we can, we can across, uh, literally across an ocean, which at the time was using Skype before Zoom was a thing, you know, in a certain sense, these youth were connecting up and, and for the youth in, in Brooklyn saying, what, the police don't have guns in, in England? Why do people like do what they say, you know, we just run. Um, 
and and then learning that the police have this massive surveillance matrix surveillance system called the matrix they literally call their surveillance system in england the matrix and the youth in, in brooklyn were like what the hell this is cray cray um and so there was ways in which these linkages were happening but there there is real potential there but i mean it is this but it is on the history that that those these countries sort of sit upon both the the horrific building up of capitalism, but also the, the radical and revolutionary ideas that emerge out of that, which, you know, um, including, you know, in thought, I mean, it, it, one person, you know, I was, I was talking about this, the, the slave rebellion reenactment where the ideas, you know, of these enslaved people were to seize Orleans territory and set up an African Republic. Well, those ideas of freedom and emancipation were far more radical than the ideas of, of you know Jefferson and 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 George Washington who wrote the Declaration of Independence, the, you know, the U.S. Constitution, and had all this "We the People" democracy bullshit in it. The people who actually understood that if you want to get free, you actually have to outlaw and abolish slavery. That was the radical thought of the day. And likewise, you know, if you take out people like Du Bois and Martin Luther King and Malcolm X and and George Jackson. Angela Davis, you don't, you, the radical thought that is in America comes out of people analyzing the, the most profound oppression in this country, and that is the, the, the people of African descent and what we've gone through. It's not, there's something special about us because of the color of our skin, but it's like the radical thought of, you know, Frederick Douglass and Ida B. Wells, that comes out of resistance to that oppression, and the, that exists, including internationally, and so, um, yeah. That's that's the foundation which we can build on and grow from. That's great. I just um, thank you so much too for this. I think there is so much, and I think that this engagement, what you get out of an engagement out of his, from history, is something that we have to remind ourselves over and over and over again that it's not just a history of oppression; it's a history of the possibility. So, um, Gina, do you want to introduce us with the music video for tonight? Because we are done here, but we're not all the way done. I know, and I, I, I want to thank you both because, of course, as we can tell, we're just warming up. Uh, there's there's much more we could be talking about, but we have much more to do in the future, and uh, we hope to continue. So I want to, um, as a gift to both of you and to our audience, we always end with music, and uh, I think tonight, uh, of all nights, we really we really need it. And this music for abolition series is curated by Terry Lynn Carrington. And tonight's uh, video comes to us from Diane Reeves and Camila Cortina Bello, uh, who is a composer of tonight's uh, song, Unspoken Voices. And Diane has written to us about um, uh, uh, the, the song as well as um, Camila. Camila says, Unspoken Voices is a call to reimagine a reality that needs a change. With an intimate and introspective tone, these voices unfold a powerful, inviting message to openness, dialogue, and a much needed change in order to build a better future. Unspoken Voices is a hymn of love, a chant for unification, and a prayer for justice. As we believe this is the most powerful way to create the opportunities and the necessary social transformation that we dream to be accountable for. And Diane writes, this winter season, covered in massive drifts of white and a sky of endless gray, represents the construct that white supremacy is held in unrelentingly. While the extreme cold is absent of forgiveness and redemption, it holds a palpable reflection of the prison industrial complex. Yet above the clouds and below the surface, there is a bold collective consciousness of humanity in all its color. Unity, power, and urgency reimagines the energy needed in the dismantling of this brutal season system with diligence and directed clarity. The wordless music of the powerful and musing, un moving composition, Unspoken Voices, written by Camila Cortina Bello, is in spirit is reminiscent of the hymns of our ancestors, which gave us strength, endurance, and affirmations for the movement forward. Thank you and good night. Imagine education. How do we reimagine community? How do we reimagine family? How do we reimagine sexual identity? How do we reimagine everything, everything in the light of a change that is so far reaching and that it's our responsibility to be? We can't expect them to make it. We have to do the real.